am so pleased to introduce my wonderful colleague, Amy Lentz with Weld County Extension. She is a guru of many things horticulture and has also really become quite proficient in growing cut flowers. She has a small business and I was given a number of her bouquets, which I was so excited for. And so Amy's going to take you through all of the steps of planning and implementing the cut flower garden. So thanks Amy for being here and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, full disclosure, my, my small business is in quotes because I never really got it off the ground. It was during the pandemic and I, I needed something to do. So I thought, well, I'll just start growing cut flowers. I gave every single bouquet away. I made no money. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't call myself a business person. This is hard work. And a lot of people are making a living at this and it, it's, it's a lot of work. So all right, let's talk today about planting the cut flower garden. Um, thank you guys so much for being here on this snowy cold day. Hopefully this will warm you all up a little bit and get you thinking about spring and summer and growing. All right, so before I get started, I just always like to kind of point out that we do have um, several resources available to you all on everything gardening, not just cut flowers. You can go to the CSU Extension website and search through our publications there. If you're just getting started in the world of horticulture and landscaping and maybe don't have quite the background, a good place to start is Plant Talk Colorado. Those are kind of pared down articles, a little bit more simple, and then they lead you to more resources. And then as always, um, check out our cohorts blog. This is written by um, all of us extension folks around the area, around the state. Um, about anything horticulture, and sometimes it's quite fun. And that's where you can also find our upcoming classes as well as those recordings. So, so those are some resources for you to consider. Today's class should be pretty fun. We're gonna, first we're gonna go on a little worldwide tour and get, go over some fun facts about the cut flower industry. It's quite a fascinating industry. We'll talk about how cut flowers are grown commercially just to get you thinking about all of the inputs and work that goes into this so that next time you go and spend the money on a bouquet, um, you can see where your money is going. And, and it really is a lot of work. Um, cut flower gardening in Colorado, we're gonna go through that in depth. Um, that's the section that you'll get the slides for today. So don't feel like you have to keep copious notes. We'll talk about planting the garden, growing, um, different selections of varieties or cultivars and how to harvest. And then we'll end up today talking about some general tips on preserving your bouquets and arranging cut flowers. So let's get started with this idea of the, the cut flower industry worldwide. So as I mentioned, huge industry, this, is, this data comes from 2019, which I think is probably pretty accurate still um, since we went through a couple of years of the pandemic. But overall, the cut flower industry is a $34.3 billion industry worldwide. There are over 15,000 florists just in the United States alone. Columbia is the top source for our flowers here in the United States. Um, you may think that it's, they're coming from somewhere else, but they're actually coming from South America. Our top holiday for selling and growing cut flowers is Christmas and Hanukkah. You would think that it would be Mother's Day. That's the top one in the United States, but Christmas and Hanukkah, both worldwide holidays and poinsettias are included in that number too. So that's why it takes the top spot. But here in the United States, it's Mother's Day is when we buy most of our bouquets. 69% um, of your gifts that day are going to be in the form of a, a flower bouquet or something like that. And $1.9 billion gets spent on flowers in just that one day, which is crazy. So as we look across the whole globe, the Netherlands really takes the top spot for the number one grower of cut flowers. They've been on the scene for a really long time. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, um, but they, they definitely hold about almost 50% of the exported flower bouquets that are out there. Then as you can see, this really, this industry covers lots of different parts of the globe. We have countries in South America, countries in Africa, in Europe, um, China. So yeah, all over the world, people are growing cut flowers. And a lot of that's because some of these cut flowers are very specific to certain locations, or they have that prime climate that they do the best in. And so um, oftentimes you'll see specializations of certain cut flowers coming from certain regions. Here's a picture of the Netherlands from up above. I just showed you kind of a field picture. If you ever get the chance to fly into Amsterdam in May, take that chance. It's amazing. I didn't take this picture, 
but I did get this experience and it was something I'll never forget. Looks like a quilt. You're just flying over a beautiful, colorful quilt. So you got to hit that in late April, early May. So the reason that the Netherlands is kind of one of those big players, I told you, goes way back in history. And there's this, this thing that happened, this phenomenon that happened in the 1600s called tulip mania. And it was actually the first economic bubble, um, although it didn't really have the economic effects as normal bubbles do, because this was really a problem for the rich. <laughs> um, what they were doing was they, they were growing tulips and trading tulips as kind of a show of status. And along the way, someone found this beautiful striped tulip that you can see in the picture there. That's Semper Augustus or Viceroy tulips. And they, they found this and they said, ooh, this one's different. Because at the time they didn't have all the tulip varieties that we do today. They may have had red ones, maybe yellow ones, some white ones, but not the, the crazy ones we have now. So when they saw this striped tulip, um, whoever that grower was decided, well, I'm going to sell it. So they would, they would sell it, but with tulips and with a lot of these flowers, you aren't selling the flower itself, you're selling the bulb. So you have to wait it out till that flower becomes spent. And by that time, you've already sold the flower. So you're kind of selling what we call a future. Um, you're speculating that it's going to be worth something once it's dug up. But it turns out this is a virus, and so it affects those tulips long term. They get smaller and smaller, and eventually they quit producing flowers. And so it turned out that they were selling these tulip bulbs um, that hadn't actually been dug yet for lots and lots of money. And it turned out, again, not worth anything, and so the bubble crashed. So there you have it, the first economic bubble caused by a tulip virus. I just find that to be really, really a fun story. Um, I, I took a lot of this information from a just a, a random YouTube video called The First Economic Bubble um, Tulip Mania. So you can check that out. So as time has gone on, the Netherlands has always stayed in that scene of being the top player in that cut flower industry. And so um, now, like I mentioned, they're, they're about 50% of the industry. They have the largest warehouse in the world um, in one single enclosed space in the world where they are moving these cut flowers in and out on these trains of, of, uh, of shelving. And it, it's crazy. It's chaos. Stuff going everywhere, moving at a fast pace. And it goes into this room where you have buyers and they are lightning fast and ordering these flowers as they roll by. It's quite the experience. Um, and again, you can... Uh, you can check out the video on YouTube about this. Um, the, the, and I, I can't remember the name. Anyway, there's a, there's a video on this too. Very, very fun. Here's another look at the Netherlands uh, industry and, and especially their tulip industry. That is the crop that grows the best there. And so um, they have a very sandy soil. Tulips love sandy soil and perfect climate. So they have a place called Kuchenhof where they display these tulips. It's a very, very large garden, and they plant about 7 million tulip bulbs or different types of flowering bulbs every year. And then they dig them up, and then they plant them again next, the next year in a different design. Here's a, a tip for you all. With all of your bulbs, your flowering bulbs, typically they're going to have their best show the first year because they are bred to be putting all of that energy into that one large single bulb. Over time, they're going to spread, create new bulbs, and the flowers might just get a little bit shorter and a little bit smaller. So when you want the most bang for your buck, you're gonna be planting every year and then digging those up and replanting. And that's what Kuchenhof does, quite labor intensive. For me personally, I just, I'm thankful that my tulips come up every year and that's about it. <laughs> so add some new ones in every now and then. So not only is Europe a big player, but now South American growers have really come onto the scene. They have a very ideal climate for these flowers. They have lower labor costs, fewer regulations than we do here in the United States and they do in Europe, a high altitude, which we have in Colorado. And so that's something that um, is interesting that they have a similar climate where they're growing some of these flowers, but they're also close to the equator. So they have those longer days, more predictable weather than we do in Colorado. Colombia is probably the main dominant cut flower grower in South America. They have about 65% of their cut flowers being exported to the United States. 
and the rest go to Europe. So we are buying most of our flowers again from Colombia. About half of those are going to be roses. They are the, one of the premier growers of roses, but they also produce carnations, mums, and other flowers. Interestingly enough, Colorado used to have the largest, not just a large carnation industry, but the largest in the world. Until the 1970s, there were some programs set up to help South America you know, get some legal industries going. And so we helped them do that. And then the carnations moved from Colorado to Columbia. So we lost that industry, but um, we've gained others and, and it's helping them out a lot um, to get their economy going. Ecuador is the next country down in South America that's growing our cut flowers. Um, this again was also kind of spun off of these prep, these trade acts or these, these promotional type of programs that the government's put together. They have about 15,000 acres in Ecuador under production and employ, employ about 100,000 people. Um, so almost a billion dollars and they are growing roses, lots of roses, um, among other flowers, but their roses are very superior. They have very large heads, long stems, very nice vibrant colors, and they're considered a luxury flower. So they're very lucrative for them to grow. So you can see, um, again, that some flowers are gonna grow better in different locations. So when we talk about all these different places and these different industries, I think it's important to keep in mind that the price of cut flowers is really dependent on a lot of factors. And sometimes it's because of where they're coming from, all of the transportation that's involved, the short lifespan or shelf life of flowers, things have to happen quick. And so you can imagine how much um, the trade system and the shipping channels have an effect on our cut flowers. So here's just some groupings of different prices that you might find out there. And so don't be surprised if you're spending $10 or more for a hydrangea that probably is as big as your head, um, but it, it can be costly. But it's worth it when you think about all the labor that goes into it. A little bit more, um, you know, as far as different things happening in different locations around the world, and we're going to get to the U.S. here in just a second. Um, this is in Germany. This is rose production. They're another big hybrid tea rose grower, and they do a lot of breeding in Germany. So this is at Cordis Rose um, on a trip that I took back in. It's been 15 years since this trip. So some of these pictures are a little bit older, but I think they're still doing things the same way. Here are some more pictures of that rose breeder in Germany. And you can see they're just getting all kinds of different colors and scents. And, and just very fun. Tulips I mentioned are really big in the Netherlands, but we in the United States have a very similar climate to the Netherlands in Washington state. And so you'll find a lot of tulip production happening um, in Washington state. This is at a place called Washington Bulb. They grow them the same and then they go through at the end of the season and they dig up those bulbs. And that's what they're selling to the public, um, to you guys to put into your yard. They usually use things like a potato digger for this kind of work, which is it's kind of interesting to see them use the same equipment. Very tied in with the Dutch market. So in, this is um, in one of their warehouses, they have both clocks, the Dutch clock and then the Washington state time. I think that's pretty interesting. Also in that same general Northwestern region of the United States, we have um, a lot of hydrangea production. Their soils are perfect for hydrangeas. They're a little bit acidic, um, well draining. They've got the cloud cover that um, hydrangeas prefer to give them really nice colors. We have trouble growing these here in Colorado. Our soils are too alkaline. Um, a lot of times they don't make it through our winters. They're a little bit marginally hardy. And so really Oregon is the premier spot to be growing those. Back when I worked at the University of Kentucky, I worked um, as a research tech right before grad school. And my job was to um, test the color of our hydrangea production. And I would match the color of this little bloom to these. This is a very specialized um, booklet of color plates that are specific for hydrangeas. And so this is one way when flowers go to the market for them to say it's this color. So it will match up to like a C34 or something like that. Notice the shade cloth here again, even in Oregon, um, they, they provide a little bit of shade cover because the hydrangeas just have a better, richer, vibrant, uh, more vibrant color with a little bit of shade. 
the sun can kind of leach them out. Just down the road, um, this is calla lily production. This is one of my favorite cut flowers. I just love the very neat architectural form to it. It's a spadix um, type of flower. And this is down the road from the cheese factory too, where you probably get your Tillamook cheese. So they're growing calla lilies there um, for the same reasons that they're growing um, hydrangeas. And then also Asian lilies are being grown in this, this same region. So if you ever get a chance to visit the Pacific Northwest, um, you look up some cut flower growers. I'm sure they'd be happy to give you a tour. Um, some beautiful, beautiful things. Right here in Colorado, we also have some cut flower production happening. Um, a group of agents and I went on a tour a few years ago and we visited Arrowhead Dahlias. This is in Platteville in Weld County. And they are growing lots of different types of dahlias, both for the sale of the blooms that they'll sell at farmer's markets. And then they also will sell the bulbs or the tubers um, when those get dug up in, and then they'll sell them to you and you can grow dahlias in your own yard. I will say they sell out very fast every year. Um, but notice what they're doing here with the shade coverings. These also act as hail cloth. Um, so they're kind of a dual purpose growing these under a little bit of shade, but also um, mostly this is for hail. A lot of hail happens sometimes um, out in that area. They're also growing in that same, that same company of Arrowhead Dahlia is also growing some Lysianthus. This is a cut flower that's pretty common, but oftentimes maybe not noticed, maybe a little overlooked. Um, it looks like a rose, but it's a little bit more delicate, not as, uh, not as many petals, but it can definitely substitute for roses. And we can grow these here in Colorado. Um, they do just need a little bit of staking and maybe some cover, um, again, for hail protection. So I'm going to stop real quick and um, check with Allison and see if we have, or if you have questions, you guys can put those into the chat. Um, and if we don't, I'll go ahead and just move forward. I didn't have anything any in questions, the but I just opened the chat. So if you do have anything, it was open just to host, but now it's open to everyone. Great. So if you have anything, I just have one comment. Miss Kelly says it's just fabulous. So you are inspiring many today, Amy, on this. Oh, good. <laughs> old snowy Wednesday. Yes, I love cut flowers. They're kind of fun. You know, I like to grow them along with my vegetable garden, kind of in the same area, um, because I kind of treat them the same. I'm harvesting them all the time, and I'm I'm watering them all the time. I like to water by hand personally, so I'll go out and I'll water by hand at the base. We'll talk about that. And then, yeah, harvest them, have fun with them, bring them inside. You can have blooms all summer long. So I see a question, um, is fair trade something worth looking into? This is directly to me um, for when buying cut flowers. And that's from Celeste. Yes, you can absolutely look into fair trade. Um, I don't know the specifics of each grower, but your florist may know where they're getting um, some of their cut flowers. You probably won't find that information from some of the you know, box store or supermarket type of florist, but more of your local florist, they may know um, about fair trade. But yeah, something to think about. But again, a lot of these industries were set up to help with um, better trade and more fair trade. So, all right. I don't see anything else, Alice. I'm going to move forward just for time's sake, but we can always circle back if you guys have any more questions about the cut flower industry um, worldwide. All right, um, let's talk about planning and designing the, the cut flower garden. So there's different ways you can do this. I just mentioned that I like to kind of grow mine in my vegetable garden area, but you don't have to do that. You can mix your flowers throughout your landscape. They're flowers, <laughs> so they can add beauty while they're still on the plant, as well as in a vase in your kitchen. So feel free to mix these things in throughout your landscape and then just go out and cut them every now and then and bring some of them inside. Otherwise, you can create what's called a working garden or a utilitarian uh, style layout of a garden like you see in the upper right hand picture there. That is where you grow things in rows and it's easier maybe to get in there and harvest, especially if you're doing this every day and you're doing this more for like a, a big hobby or a business, small business. Um, you probably want to set it up more in a traditional um, kind of like a vegetable garden style. When you do this, you want to make sure that you have um, the rows that are spaced enough so that you can get in between and move through. You don't want to be brushing up against your blooms and knocking them off and damaging them. So give yourself a little bit of space. But honestly, you can pack a lot of stuff into a small area, as you can see in that picture. 
You can do this also in raised beds. You can do this in containers. The lower left hand, or I'm sorry, the lower right hand picture there is a shipping container that my husband happened to have at work. Um, they sell some large items and, and this came in and um, I said, bring that home. I, I drilled some holes in the bottom, filled it up with some uh, potting mix. And there you go, a little tiny cut flower garden going for you. That has some cosmos and I believe some zinnias growing in it. So when you're planning out and getting ready to decide where to put your cut flower garden, you want to make sure that you're choosing a sunny site. Um, I mentioned hydrangeas don't like a lot of sun, but we're not really growing a lot of hydrangeas here, so you don't have to worry about that. Most of our cut flowers, I, I mean almost all of them, want that full sun. Flowers are meant to be seen, and so um, a lot of times you don't find a lot of flowers that grow well in the shade. Um, we might have a class on that down the road on shade flowers, but for the most part, go with a very sunny site. You're going to need at least eight hours of sunlight per day in, in the height of the summer when these are really growing and blooming. They are going to need a well-drained soil. So if you have heavy clay, you might think about adding about eight inches of compost, um, well-composted um, organic material into your garden beds work that up and that can help improve both clay and sandy soils. Um, sandy soils can drain really fast, so you might be watering more often. Um, just keep that in mind as well. And then finally, you might think about putting in a wind buffer. As you can see in the picture there, there's a row of raspberries or blackberries along the backside um, that can act as a, wind, as a wind buffer. You could plant these on the south side of a fence. Um, where the fence is behind it to the north that can help buffer some of those north winds or use your house or use a tree. Um, but just think about trying to get a little bit of a wind um, buffer. I've grown these out in the middle of the field though too and, and oftentimes they'll be fine. Um, it's not a, a super big requirement, but it can help. All right, when you're making your rows, if you're deciding to do that row style, you wanna to try to keep your rows no wider than four feet. And that's just so that you can reach into the middle and reach down and cut those flowers where you need them. If it's wider than that, you're just gonna have some trouble getting in there and you could end up damaging the flowers around you that you wanna save or cut, you know, cut later. Use those narrower, narrower planting rows for those taller flowers, just because they can um, shade out other flowers and it can be hard again to get into the middle and harvest. And so you might wanna do those in two feet rows or three foot rows. And then also you wanna make sure that those aren't blocking the light um, to other plants around them, those taller plants. You can also think about things like grouping your species of plants um, into different uses. And so maybe you've got um, a lot of cone flowers. Maybe you want to put all of those together just so that you're always harvesting those at the same time. Um, so if you have different varieties, you might think about that. It just could be easier. Do plant your tall types together, again, away from the, the little itty bitty guys because you don't want to be shading them out. So give them their own space. And then clustering them together with things like sun requirements, water requirements, and drainage can just help um, with your watering schedules and keep everybody happy. All right, to get the most maximum production, um, you wanna be planting annuals and perennials by your bloom period. So we have early season bloomers like our tulips maybe, um, is one that I think of. There are others that can come to mind. I'm drawing a blank. Mid-season bloomers like your um, snapdragons and zinnias and things like that. And then you might have some late season bloomers like your sunflowers. So think about planting lots of different types of cut flowers so that you always have something to harvest. With things like your, your sunflowers, um, especially the single stem, as soon as you cut them, you're pretty much done with that plant. And so for those, you might think about planting those in groups um, for succession planting, where maybe you plant, I don't know, 10 or 12 sunflowers, wait, and then plant 10 or 12 more sunflower plants two weeks later, and then another two weeks later. And that's gonna give you this staggered effect when they do bloom so that you're not, and you don't end up with, you know, 100 sunflowers all at one time, if you have that kind of space to grow sunflowers. When you're thinking about um, choosing different varieties of cut flowers, uh, you wanna be looking 
at plants and varieties that have longer stems. There are going to be, even within the same um, plant or, or genus, you'll find that there's short guys and then there's the tall ones. Um, one that comes to mind, and we'll, I'll cover this in a little bit, is called um, ageratum or floss flower. There's the bedding plants that might only be eight to 10 inches tall. And then there are the taller um, cut flower varieties um, with names like Blue Horizon or Blue Planet, it's a blue flower, and, and they're taller. And look for things like Mammoth, Horizon, Planet, those, those names that lead you to believe that they're very tall. You also might want to think about choosing cut flowers that have long, a long base life. Um, it, there are a lot of beautiful flowers out there in the world, and not all of them make good cut flowers. Um, they might only last a day or two in a, in a vase. Um, poppies are one of those that I think of that may not have quite the vase life as some other ones. Some varieties of cosmos just don't last as long. Um, but then there are some dahlias and zinnias and carnations can last weeks if you take care of them the right way. So um, look for also um, everlasting flowers. I'm gonna cover a, a group of these down a, a little bit in the presentation of flowers that you can dry. So once they're done in the vase, just pull them out, let them dry out a little bit, and then they actually will keep their color for a really long time. Think about planting different varieties, different textures. Don't forget your greenery. This is one of those things that we plant all these pretty colors and then we kind of forget about the greenery. Um, and really color depending is really a personal choice. It depends on what you like to grow. You may love these delphiniums. This is in the front here, these purple flowers. Um, or you may like something different, like some of the darker colored, um, I'm not sure what those are, maybe Joe Pye. So yeah, it's up to you. Whatever color you like is, is what you should go with. And then also don't forget, there are a lot of things around your landscape that you can use as cut flowers that you may not have thought of. So we've talked about annuals and perennials. Those are the ones we always think of, but you can also pull from your woody plants, like your trees. So the upper left-hand picture is of a hot wings maple. Um, you could definitely cut one of those in the middle of summer. It's gonna look just like that and add that to your bouquet for a little bit of interest. Um, there are vines out there. Kenzie's Ghost is a plant select vine. That's in the upper right. Um, that's one you can add in kind of in place of like a eucalyptus kind of plant. It kind of has the similar look. Um, don't forget about your spring bloomers. So the bottom left is forsythia. You can actually cut these when they're still dormant. So about now, um, anytime in the next maybe month or two, once those flower buds have set, um, before they bloom, cut them, bring them inside and they're gonna bloom inside for you. They're gonna get used to that warm air and they're just gonna pop right open. Um, you can do that with crab apples, forsythia, any flowering woody plant that's one of those early spring bloomers. Um, so try that out too, that could be quite interesting. You can use grasses, the seed heads from grasses. This one is Blonde Ambition, Blue Grandma Grass, um, has those nice little horizontal seed heads. Those can definitely add some interest as well. And then you might not realize that you could use that kale or maybe that basil that you're growing in your vegetable garden and use that for greens um, and greenery as well. So lots of different things can be used for cut flowers. Doesn't have to be what we typically think of. All right, back to the, um, the kind of the growing aspects of all of this. When you are growing some of these flowers, I mentioned they grow pretty tall. You may need to stake them. Um, not all of them have the strongest of stems. Uh, the picture that you see here is of snapdragons. And for this, they're using what's called this, this wide spaced mesh. It usually comes in a roll. Typically it's gonna be three or four feet wide and maybe a roll of a hundred feet or something like that. So you can just use what you need, save some for later. But this is set up in a grid pattern when the plants are still below that level. And then as they grow up, they're gonna grow up into that grid and it's gonna help try to keep them in place a little bit. Tomato cages are also another option that you can use um, for a lot of your cut flowers. Again, just put them in place before the flowers get too tall or you can cause some damage as you're trying to install those. Irrigating the cut flower garden. So um, I mentioned earlier that I'm kind of a hand waterer when it comes to my cut flower area and my little vegetable garden area. I just, 
I just like to do that. Um, you don't have to do that. You can totally set it up on automatic irrigation and set it and forget it <laughs> kind of thing um, and just go out and cut every now and then. But when you are watering, if you are irrigating like me from hand, um, you want to make sure that you are avoiding overhead irrigation and not just spraying all over the leaves. There are cases where you might do that. Um, maybe you're trying to knock down some bugs or something, you can do that. But on a regular basis, you wanna be hand watering at the base of your plant or using that drip irrigation. Um, but avoid drought stress if at all possible with your cut flower garden. Some of these are more drought friendly than others. Um, so some of the everlasting type of flowers, the status, the um, globe amaranth, I'll show you pictures of these in just a minute. Those can handle more drought, a little bit more drought stress, um, even some native type of cut flowers. But for most of them, they're not going to be very drought tolerant. So try to avoid drought stress. It can slow the, slow the flower production. You may get your flowers falling off here and there. Um, and so again, think about what you're growing and how much water it needs. And that's where we go back to maybe grouping those flowers into different sections based on that watering requirement. Water is probably one of those more limiting things uh, for here in Colorado. I do get questions sometimes on fertilizing the cut flower garden, and it's important. Um, this is one of those crops that really is going to need a little bit of supplemental fertilizer. They are blooming, they are creating flowers, and flowers require nutrients to do that. Um, sometimes you'll even find uh, bloom boosting type of fertilizers on the market. Those are going to be high in phosphorus. Keep that in mind that you don't want to be overusing those because they can cause, um, you don't want to be having runoff of, phos of high phosphorus fertilizers, but you can use those sparingly, mix them up and just add them, you know, maybe every other week or every, you know, few weeks to help your blooms go along. You can also use what are called um, dilute foliar sprays that can help boost energy um, for so, some of these heavier bloomers, but you have to be very careful with this. Please do some research and background, look up the background on this um, because it has to be done in the morning so that the foliage dries. Um, it only works for certain species and it can burn the leaves if it's too hot and dry outside, so be careful with that. Otherwise, just mix in a little bit of a slow acting granular fertilizer into the bed at the beginning of the season. Hit them every now and then with a little supplemental fertilizer if they're not looking like um, as vibrant as you want them. And that's slow acting stuff can be found in any garden center, hardware store, um, you, you name it. So sprinkle that on top. All right, couple more slides here and then I'm gonna stop and we'll take some more questions. Maintaining the cut flower garden. So, um, you want to be thinking about, we, we just covered water saving. So you want to be thinking about saving the water that you're putting on. And to do that, you can just spread a two or three inch layer of mulch down around the bottom of the bed of your, your flowers. That's going to help with weeding as well as keeping that water from evaporating. A lot of these cut flowers are um, what we call cut and come again or heavy bloomers, um, but they're meant, they're meant, they're bred to be cut. So you will want to initiate flower production by making that first cut at the beginning of the year and then continuing, continuing to cut your blossoms regularly to help keep that flower production going. This is especially true with flowers like dahlias. Um, they'll grow up and you'll get that first flower and it's usually huge, but the stem on it is super short. And what the plant does is it puts all of its energy into growing that one flower that it's not growing the rest of the flowers that you're gonna want later on. So I know it's hard. Cut that, that first flower off. Go put it in a cute little mug or something on your kitchen counter. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna initiate all the rest of those flower buds that are in that plant to start developing. So you've gotta do that initial cut and then continue to cut because the more you cut, the more blooms you're gonna get down the road. Perennials, if you deadhead those, they're going to bloom for a longer period. So if you start to see some flowers being spent, like you see in the picture here with this rose, go ahead and cut that off. Because what the flower is doing at that point is it's putting all of its energy into forming seeds so for the next generation. That's what flowers are really meant to do. Um, I mean, they're pretty on your counter, but <laughs> they're really there for the plant to reproduce. So you want to keep them from going to seed by cutting those flowers off because that's a very energy intensive process. 
So um, deadhead and keep cutting and you're going to be better off. I know it's sometimes a little counterintuitive to think about, you know, if I cut this one, then I'm not going to have one. Trust me, you're going to get more. All right, I'm going to stop and then we're going to go through these different groups of flowers. Um, I see the chat going a little bit. So yeah, Amy, and maybe you'll talk about this. Once you cut the flowers, are you going to talk about preservatives and how to keep them going indoors once you cut them? Okay. Yes. That's we are going to cover that toward the end. We're going to go through some flowers and then we'll talk about the preservatives. I've got a couple of home recipes for you guys and we'll do a little bit of flower arranging tips. Okay. And then there were a few questions on seed. So maybe okay. if you just cover the basics of growing by seed, maybe flowers that grow best by direct sowing. And then yeah. there's a more specific one that I'll answer. Carolina, I'll get to you. Okay. Um, all of your perennials are probably going to be easy. Well, I won't say all of them. A lot of your perennials should be easy to just go ahead and direct seed and let them grow. Like your cone flowers, you could probably direct seed those. Um, but otherwise, just go ahead and buy the plants in the, in the nurseries. As far as starting a lot of these annuals from seed, some of these are really easy. Um, and, and it just so happens that the easy to grow slide is up, so I'll cover those. Sunflowers are pretty easy to grow from seed, um, but those you want to go directly into the ground. Uh, the rest of the, and marigolds, uh, well, no, sunflowers go directly into the ground. The rest of these you might want to start indoors. Cosmos, you could probably go directly into the ground. Zinnias, you could go directly into the ground. Otherwise, start them inside. Um, they don't take very long at all. Uh, all of the ones that are listed here are pretty quick growers, except for maybe the snapdragons. Those can take a little bit more time to get going. Um, but you can start inside or you can direct sow with a lot of these. Really, it's going to be very um, species dependent. So read your seed packet to know which way they prefer. But there's just different ways to do this. And so um, it's not too late either. You can start marigolds. Um, you can even wait a little bit, start them in a few weeks, um, start your zinnias in a few weeks, your cosmos, all of these almost, you can start in a few weeks. If you got snapdragons, start them now. Again, they just take a couple more extra weeks. Did I answer that okay, Allison? Yes, and then Amy did teach seed starting in January, which is posted and I'll post that in the chat for everybody. So you can refer to that on general seed starting tips because it is not too late. It's actually getting to be the perfect time. Mm -hmm. Yep. I did have a question come in about, maybe you, oh no, this is your answer, but yes, pre-forced pre bulbs in the grocery stores um, might take a year or two to get back up to speed. Uh, let's see. Someone asked if there's an advantage to using organic compost and potting soils. Um, two different things, two different locations. Your organic compost is what you're going to want to put in with the soil as a soil amendment. Um, potting soil, you want to be putting that more into those raised bed container, or like the container, large containers, maybe a little bit in your raised bed, um, but those are generally more for containers. Oh, lots of questions. Let's see. And I, I'm getting some person, some that are coming directly to me too. Um, so someone planted some tulips, great success, um, but not great for cutting because they're small and close to the ground. Great, great question or great comment, Elizabeth. Um, yes, there are just like those different, those different age or item sizes I was telling you about, tulips are the same. And when you go to order tulips in a catalog, you'll notice that the height, there's a lot of difference in some of the heights of these. Some are 12 to 16 inches, probably not going to grow great for cut flowers. But then there are others, um, I wanna say one is called like the Prince series, uh, they're two feet tall. So look for those taller varieties of tulips and, and those types of bulbs. All right, let's see. I think we already talked a little bit about seed production. Um, and just so you guys know, some seeds can take a long time. So again, read those packets. Uh, we used to start, I know petunia is not a cut flower, but we used to start petunias in early January to have them for sale by April. So that was back in Kentucky, but um, yeah, some can take quite a long time, 12 or more weeks. And some might even require some um, dormancy breaking techniques as well, like cold stratification, big words. I don't wanna get too technical with that kind of stuff. Look at the seed starting um, class. It talks all about that. Yes, yes, cut the first dahlia bloom. I'm seeing, I'm still a question about that. 
Don't wait, cut it. All right, dahlias can do pretty good in containers if you have a big enough container. That it can get to be a very large plant. So you have to have a very large container. So I have a question on that. All right, I think I'm going to, uh, one more question and I'm gonna move on. Is it okay to reuse potting soil for more than one year? Uh, yes and no. If you do reuse your potting soil, make sure that it doesn't have anything funky growing in it. <laughs> That's always good. Make sure that the plants that were in it before, the year before were healthy. If they were not healthy, don't reuse it. But then if you are gonna reuse it, mix it with 50% new stuff so that you are not um, just solely using old potting soil. So 50-50. All right. All right. I'm gonna keep going. Um, someone did ask if lupine is a good cut flower and I'm not super sure about its face life. And so I'm gonna ask Allison if you could look up the face life of a lupin. All right, easy to grow cut flowers. So if you are beginning and you want a little cut flower garden, this is a great place to start. Sunflowers are kind of that, you know, the wow factor that you can get and they're easy to grow and they grow fantastic in Colorado. They grow on the roadside. So, you know, they're going to go really well in your, your yard. Annual Rudbeckia. So we think of these as black eyed Susans, but black eyed Susans are typically perennial Rudbeckias, which also can be used as cut flowers. But there's a whole host of these annual Rudbeckias out there. And, um, some, let's see, there's one called Irish Spring, Indian Summer, Prairie, Prairie uh, Sun, lots of different ones. Sometimes they have a green eye, sometimes they have a brown eye, or they'll have these two-tone looks like you see in that upper right picture. Cosmos, very, very easy to grow. These are going to be more in the pinks and purples. They don't have quite the length of vase life, maybe a week before they start dropping those petals. Um, but still a nice cut flower. And then zinnias, you can find any color that you, except for blue, you can really get any color, purple, pink, yellow, white, red, orange, you name it. Snapdragons, I've got a picture of those um, in a couple more slides and marigolds. If you can, if you like the smell of marigolds, you can add those into your cut flower arrangements too. Some people don't like that. Personal choice, up to you. All right, zinnia. So I just mentioned that these you can get in any color. So here you go. There's a, a little display of all the different colors that you can get. Um, there are different varieties that are um, better for cut flowers. There are little bedding zinnias that usually have a single row of petals and they're pretty short. But look for those cut flower types like Benary's Giants, State Fair Mix, um, Oklahoma mix is another one. Long stems, but the, the flowers on the Oklahoma are just about an inch in size. And lots and lots of other ones out there. Purple Prince is one I grew last year. Um, but yeah, lots and lots. Cut and Come Again is another one that you'll see quite often. And those are usually coming to you in a mixed bag. So you may not know what colors you're going to get. Here are those snapdragons I told you about. Um, gosh, they just add such a neat look to a bouquet and they're really easy to grow. Uh, they have that pea uh, look to them in the bean family, that kind of bean shaped flower. And there are varieties of these as well that are specifically meant for cut flowers. So rocket is one variety. Madam butterfly is another one. Apple blossom is the one that you see there in the middle that has a white color to it with just a little bit of a pink splotch. You can also collect seed from some of these snapdragons, the, the ones that are more um, heirloom type and, and just regrow again the next year. So if you find a color you really like, maybe collect some seed um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's one you like. All right, so those are the easy guys to start with. Um, if you want something that's gonna be stand out and big and bold, here are some options for those. Celosia is a, a very interesting flower. It's kind of like a chenille or a velvet. Um, it has kind of these little hairs all over it. And these can come in these, um, I don't know how else to describe it. They almost like brains, <laughs> like you see here, or they will come in a spike or a plume. So two different flower head types, but all celosia, all kind of that chenille look, very strong chenille look to it. Um, gladiolas, also grown here in Colorado. There are some growers in Weld County that do this. And these are those long spikes with the flowers going up in succession. Uh, dahlias, there again, you saw arrowhead dahlias. There's other dahlia growers throughout the state and they are just 
I love the dahlia. It's probably my favorite flower right, right now. <laughs> my favorite flower changes. <laughs> right now it's the dahlia. Um, I've got, I don't know, five or six different kinds that I'm going to try this year. And they're just so perfect. I just love the architectural perfectness of a dahlia. Peonies are another one you can try. These are short blooming perennials. This is one you would mix in with your landscape. And they're going to have a bloom period in the early summer. And then they're going to be done. Um, they're actually, we, there's a webinar we had a, a couple years ago um, from Alaska where they're growing peonies in Alaska because their harvest window is just a little bit later than everybody else. So when all the other peonies are off the market, here comes Alaska showing up with some peonies. So that's kind of cool. Again, working with the different climates and niches to, to get to the industry. And then there's other big standout flowers, roses, sunflowers, coneflowers. Um, the Black Eyed Susan can create a nice punch, um, or the zinnia. Again, there's a lot of those zinnias that are huge heads and very bright colors. Here's a look at some sunflowers for you. These can get very tall. Um, you don't want the seed head, the seed type producing sunflowers. Uh, you want the, usually the non-pollinating kind. Um, the big mammoth ones, I mean, this, the head on that thing is as big as my head and it's not gonna fit in a vase. So look for those specific types. The Pro Cut series are pollenless. At least they say they are. I think they are. Um, and they'll be a once cut. You cut once, you might get a little couple little flowers after that, but that one main flower is going to be it for that plant. Um, another one is the Sunrich series. Again, non-branching, one stem per flower. There's um, Starburst, there's Moulin Rouge. That's the upper right picture that you see there. Or a Chianti looks very similar to that picture. Um, kind of that deep wine color. Firecracker is the upper left, and then Teddy Bear, one of my favorites at the bottom, um, doesn't really have as strong of an eye. It's more of just a lot of petals. Very cute, very fun flower, aptly named. Roses, so hybrid tea roses are the ones you want for your cut flowers. There are shrub roses, like knockout roses. Those generally don't have the wow factor, and they just have a single row of petals. The hybrid teas are the ones that you get when you get a bouquet for flower or for Valentine's Day or something like that. Lots of different colors are out there. Um, this is a whole other class. So hopefully down the road, we'll get you another hour just on growing hybrid tea roses because it's just a different setup system altogether. And I know we have some master gardeners who are very well versed in roses that could teach this. So um, I won't I won't harp on this, but just know that there's some great ones out there. When you're thinking about this, so we've talked about those easy ones to grow, but those big standout flowers, you also need filler type plants or your bouquet is going to look a little off balance. So um, here are some options for that. Ageratum is the one I mentioned earlier, those Blue Horizon or Blue Planet or, or some of those type of names. That's this purple flower here, also called Floss Flower. Love it. Um, snapdragons. There's a snapdragon. Whoops, excuse me, one too many. There's a snapdragon here. Um, status, that's the second picture. These are one of those that can dry as well. Uh, gomfrina is another one that can dry as well. Here's the gomfrina, this little purple guy hanging off to the side here. Uh, Cosmos in the middle up here. And then Bells of Ireland, a beautiful, um, more of a filler type, or it could be a foliage plant, or it could be a, a wow factor, because it's just such a neat looking flower. Um, be careful, Bells of Ireland have some wicked thorns on them, and you'll want to, um, don't have your kids harvesting those. Here's some more foliage plants for you, maybe things that don't necessarily bloom, but have that good foliage that you want. Dusty Miller, uh, Bells of Ireland again, even though that's more of the flower, it looks more like foliage. Coleus uh, down here in the lower left. Sage, basil, a lot of your herbs can be used in arrangements as well. And then there are other things that you might find in your garden like coral bell leaves, peony leaves. Um, if you're growing asparagus, the ferns off of those can be great in a cut flower arrangement, pastas, tons of stuff. And then there are some that are meant more for the scent. So we have sweet pea at the top. Um, that's a nice one. I, mean, I think it's more of an early bloomer, more cool season plant. Stock. Um, I've never been able to grow stock like that. That is gorgeous. 
Uh, that's a commercial grower for you <laughs> right there. Um, lilacs or lilacs, you can grow these all over the front range. Um, a lot of places in Colorado, you can grow lilacs and they smell wonderful. It's a woody plant, perennial. So something, you, again, you can mix in with your landscape. And then there's a whole host of other flowers that have been bred for their scents. If you're looking at roses specifically, the older garden roses have the better smells. They've bred them over the years for longevity and color, and some of that smell had kind of gone to the wayside. So look for those older varieties of roses if that's what you're going for. And then I told you I would talk about flowers that last. Here we have the globe amaranth. This is also called gomfrina. That's the scientific name. I love this one. Uh, it'll keep its color for years as a dried flower. Here's a whole dried flower bouquet you can see. There's the globe thistle and the status. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. And then this bottom picture is the straw flower. Uh, here's where you can kind of get some oranges and reds and different colors in. Um, and those will also keep their color for a very long time. And these are all pretty drought tolerant as well, except for the hydrangea. It's kind of the oddball. It actually dries beautifully, but it, it loves water. All right, so we've covered some flowers. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna go ahead and finish out these next few slides and then we'll um, take some questions at the end in case people only have that one hour for lunch. So tools for cutting your flowers, you're gonna need a bucket of water. It's gonna be right there next to you when you're harvesting. You just need to fill it with a few inches of water so that the bottom of the stem can get into the water. Um, you can have various sizes of buckets that can be helpful depending on the different sizes of your flowers. Notice too the shade canopy in this picture here. Once you've cut those flowers in your garden or outside in the sun, try to get them into shade or indoors quicker if you can, um, just to help them not dry out too much or, or get become too stressed. You want to use a very sharp knife, and I underline sharp there. Um, if you're going to just be using the knife to cut, it's just a quick um, action away from you down the stem to cut it. Or you can use these pruning shears. Um, these are floral specific shears, a much smaller, thinner blade to help you get in between those stems as they're all packed together in your bed. And you can cut just the one that you want with that type of a blade. You can use regular pruners as well. Um, your, your regular scissors, um, just like these, these are probably gonna end up um, getting busted after some time. They just don't have the strength. Then you wanna think about flower preservative. I've got a slide on that we're gonna cover in just a minute. Um, you'll need a vase um, to put those flowers in or a cup or anything really that can hold that water. And then just a fun artistic eye or even just have fun with it. You don't even have to be an artist for this. The flowers are gonna provide the art. So um, don't worry about it, just put them in a vase. When you're cutting those flowers, you wanna do this in the morning on a cool day or the early evening if it's been cool throughout the day. Um, or inside where it's cool and shady and, and you can recut those even. There are these things that you can get that will strip the leaves and the thorns off, especially for roses. This is a really great tool. Um, otherwise, you can use that really sharp knife, again, moving away from your body very quickly down the side of the stem. But you do want to remove the thorns from your arrangements if you can. Um, those bells of Ireland, though, just tell people don't touch them. <laughs> it's really hard to find the thorns until they prick you and it hurts. Put those stems into water immediately upon cutting. Again, put them into a cool room overnight. If you treat these things properly, you're going to get at least two weeks out of them, if not more. Oftentimes, I'll pull out the ones that are spent, leave the ones that are still going, and just keep adding to that same arrangement. Replace the water every now and then to make sure it doesn't get gunky. Um, but yeah, you can have a vase uh, flower arrangement last for quite a while. Here's that flower preservative. You can get this at flower shops or nurseries. Uh, if you're buying flowers at the supermarket, uh, every single uh, range or bouquet or, or group of flowers will come with one of these. I don't use a lot of it, so I just use half, kind of tie it up a little bit, and then I'll use the rest of it later. So you can kind of stockpile this stuff um, because you always end up with more than you need. Or you can create your own. Um, one part lemon lime soda, like a Sprite, Sierra Mist, something like that, just not diet. Three parts water and a little tiny quarter teaspoon of bleach. Or you can use two tablespoons of lemon juice, a tablespoon of sugar, 
Um, if you don't have that lemon lime soda around, and then again, add that just a little tiny bit of bleach to the quart of warm water, mix that up and there you've got your preservative. Aspirin and vinegar have not been found to be effective. None of this I don't think is really research based, but um, that's how they're doing it. So try that out. And then finally, uh, uh, two more slides. Uh, I do wanna mention dying flowers. We're coming up on the, the Easter holiday and people will be dying eggs with their kids and grandkids. I thought, you know, maybe this is something else fun that you could do. Um, carnations work really great for this. If you can go out and just get some white carnations at the, at the florist or at the grocery store, put 10 drops of food coloring into a vase or a beaker, fill it with water, cut the stems, put them in there and just wait it out and it will pull up the dye and you'll get these little different colors that don't make any sense, like this, this bright green mum over here uh, or this blue tipped rose. Uh, you'll never see these in the wild. If you see this in your uh, grocery store or your florist, they're dyed, so now you know. And then finally, I wanna end things up today with some flower arranging tips. Um, this is just to help you out if you aren't the most artistic and need a little bit of a, a, a protocol to go by. Um, think about how your arrangement is going to be viewed. Is it, is it going to all be viewed from one side or do you want it to be viewed from all sides? Think about the height of your arrangement compared to the height of your container. It should be at least one to two times the height of the container to not look like it's being swallowed up. Um, cut those flowers at various lengths. Get That way you can get some different heights going on. Maybe cluster flowers together, like you see in this arrangement here in the lower um, right, where they've got the roses off to one side, the Gerbera daisies off to the other. Think about that. Um, one thing to note, you do want to remove all the foliage and flowers that are below the water line. It can just get kind of, um, it can just start to decompose and cause a little bit of a sliminess to it. So cut those off um, and that won't happen as much. Use lots of filler. Think of it as a neutral. You can use, like in this case, they've used the reds as fillers, or here they've used the oranges as fillers. It can be a monochrome or it can be a very colorful bouquet like the one in the upper right. You can even get modern and fancy like this one down here in the lower left. Have a focal point if you can, um, use those bigger bold flowers to do that. Create some different movement, add some interest with some things like pine cones or bamboo sticks as you see in this other arrangement. But above all, just use your gut instinct, have fun with it, don't worry about the rules. Again, the flowers are going to be beautiful enough um, and hopefully um, you know, make up for anything that you, you don't have artistically. And this can just be fun, so have fun with it. All right, so we will stop now and take more questions. And if you do need to go, thank you so much for joining us um, for your lunch hour today. And, and hopefully this inspires you to, to grow a little bit more um, in the way of cut flowers. Fun stuff.